Palawan is a very, very to important topic, which maybe not all of us have uh, as much knowledge in terms of the context living in this country, which we're going to be looking into, inshallah, with regards to when I pass away, who gets what of my house, of my money, what laws in this country affect what we're going to be leaving behind, inshallah. And the speaker today, uh, same speaker as last time, inshallah, Imam Muhammad Khan, and uh, I'll over to him, inshallah, because we've got one hour, inshallah. He did all praise for Allah. We praise Him, we seek His aid and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within our own selves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides to the straight path of Al Islam, then none can misguide Him. And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray, then there's no one who can guide him to the straight path of Al-Islam. And I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone having no partners. And that Muhammad is Allah's slave and final messenger. The best speech is the book of Allah, the Quran. And the best guidance is the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad for ever, and the best and the worst of all affairs in this religion are those matters newly introduced into them. For every such matter is a heresy, and every heresy is going astray. I'd like to welcome you all, inshallah, to this uh, session, alhamdulillah, with Professor Fikr, on Islamic wills and inheritance planning. And before we go into the main part of it, I just wish to begin with the words of Allah. Where he Jalla wa'ala says after A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Fadkuruni adkurukum wa shkuruli wa la takfurun Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sta'inu bil sabri wa salah Inna Allah ma'as sabirin The 
verses we recited from Surah Al-Baqarah was referring to several things, but amongst which was the reality that when we are faced with a musibah, a calamity, and Allah refers in a separate place in the Quran as death being musibah, musibah to the most, that when we are confronted with this reality of death, which each and every one of us will be confronted with. How is it that we will respond? Will it be with the required amount of patience in the face of the anguish or not? When death approaches, we need to face that anguish with patience. We need to actually make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rahmah upon the deceased, and above all, we need to learn the lessons from death. SubhanAllah brothers and sisters in Islam, how many deaths do we need to witness before we learn the lessons? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, al mutual rivalry in trying to increase and amass our wealth, our, our status, our prestige, our influence, our this, our that, it diverts us and distracts us from the things in this world that really matter and the things from the, in the hereafter, above which nothing else can matter more than that. And yet, we return from the, from the janaris, from the janazas, and we still don't learn that lesson. Today, we need to reflect on the following factor. That Allah Azza wa Jal, He refers to Islam not as a religion, but as a deen, as a way of life. And so, it is a reality that the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they give us guidance in every aspect of our life. Not just in our ibadat, in how we do our salah and our siyah, but in every aspect of our life. And chief amongst that will of course be matters pertaining to life and death. One of the few realities, brothers and sisters, that we know when we are born is that we will definitely come to die. And so it's not surprising that the Qur'an describes in some detail how we should go about, and the Sunnah explains also in some detail, how we should go about our affairs with respect to the death. And many of us, we are aware of how we should go about, for example, when the person dies, dies they should be washed, the ghusl should take place, they should be shrouded, right? And thereafter they're going to also be buried, the, the kafan and the dafan. And the Ghusr, we're aware of this, we're meticulous about this, we're scrupulous in our efforts to carry this out correctly and accurately. But how many of us actually make the, take the due diligence before that, in terms of us writing a will, that's in accordance with the Qur'an? How many of us have a will? I'm not going to ask anyone here, the, the, the brothers and sisters, to raise their hands and to reflect how many of us actually have a will, let alone one which is actually compliant with the Qur'an and Sunnah. This is something to think about and reflect. And this is part of the deen, as we're going to see later on today. This is something which Allah Azza wa Jalla, He mentions in great detail in the Quran. In greater detail, perhaps, that you'll find than even the Salah is mentioned. In greater detail than even Siyam, fasting, which is approaching us soon, is again, greater detail than that's mentioned, is the laws of inheritance. And there are chapters written in the books of fiqh known as Kitab al-Mawarith and Kitab al-Fara'il, the book of inheritance, and Kitab al wasaya the book of legacies. But today, inshallah, we're just going to take dip in, a dip into this huge topic and taste some of its sweetness and its understand and appreciate its importance in our context in the UK. So, an overview of today's session. We're going to first and foremost address the Sharia perspective on the laws of inheritance. And this is obviously important because for us, the touchstone in our lives is of course going to be guided from our Creator Azza wa But then we need to also appreciate that in order for us to implement the guidance from Allah in our lives, we need to be aware of our context. Our context is within the UK British law. 
So if we don't understand how the, the, the legal system over here works and how, how it will impact us if we're not aware of it, then subhanAllah, the chances of, it, us, of us applying the shara'i' in our lives diminishes, if not, it goes to nothing. And then also, we have situations, and this is very important, brothers and sisters, because within the Sharia our councils up and down the country, we receive many, and in the masajid, we receive many complaints as imams and as activists from families of disputes that occur because a will hasn't been made and because it hasn't been done according to the Sharia of guidelines. And this causes immense difficulties for families, for our families, once we pass away because we didn't make that effort. And I'm making the effort we're talking about is 10 minutes, 15 minutes, is making an Islamic law. And yet, us not having done this leaves fathers and sons not talking to one another. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, siblings squabbling and maybe not speaking. Sometimes those siblings, their children as well, are not allowed to talk to one, one another again because of this. So this is very, very important. And then also, as part of this session, we also want to briefly touch on UK inheritance tax implications. Because many times, as we'll see, people are, lose out on many large sums of their inheritance because they, the people writing the world didn't take heed of aspects of tax law which affect them without them being aware. And lastly, we'll summarize with some of the Islamic wills and inheritance solution. I want to say one thing at this onset, on, at onset however. Tonight will be, for me, somewhat of a failure if I just sit here with you and I explain to you all of the importance of this topic and how it works and you go away and you don't make sure you fulfill, fulfill this wajib, perhaps, upon some of us. And so, alhamdulillah, we will even give you today a chance to convert your ilm that you will get tonight with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal, converting that in into amal, into knowledge, into action. You will be given a free template of a will. And we would like you to take it away, and either that will or another will, it can be on a separate piece of paper if you want to do it. Just your own piece of paper. But we want you to fulfill that duty upon us and upon yourselves. In this city or tonight, and not to delay. Okay, brothers? Inshallah. 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 That's what we like to do. So, Sharia and inheritance. In the hadith of Bukhari, and this hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, رضي الله تعالى عنهما, the son of Umar ibn Khattab. It, it's occurring in the most authentic book after the book of Allah, Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet said, ما حق امرئ مسلم له شيء يوصي فيه يبيت ليلتين إلا ووصيته مكتوبة عنده It is a duty upon a Muslim, upon every Muslim that he does not let three nights as it occurs in the Riwayah of Muslim and in the Riwayah of Bukhari two nights go except that he has his bequest with him and it's with him and no two nights pass except that he has it written down. How many nights have passed in our lives and we do not have a will? We do not have a bequest. We have become negligent and heedless of the rights of the creation of Allah such that we have things that we need to actually bequeath. Responsibilities on our shoulders. And we haven't taken any heed of this. Abdullah ibn Umar, the, the Rawi, the narrator of this hadith. What was his name? Abdullah ibn Umar. He said, it's very interesting and it's important. He says, after I heard this hadith, I didn't let a single night go except that I had my will under my pillow at night when I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. This is how seriously the harbour took it. How seriously are we going to take this tonight? Mm -hmm. We hear this information. We hear this hadith from Al Habib, Alayhi Salatu Salam, Sayyidina Allah Yusuf Brothers. <laughs> We hear this hadith, and yet, will we act the way the Sahaba acted? Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, 
فإن آمن بمثل ما آمنت به فقد اهتدوا. If they believe in the way that you O Sahaba have believed, then they have truly become rightly guided. Are we going to tonight believe and show iman in the way the Sahaba, like Abdullah ibn Umar, showed iman and convert her into Amr? Surah An-Nisa, it mentions very clearly, in explicit detail, the shares to be allocated to various people. The father gets so much, the wife gets so much, the husband gets so much. The male and the female have a two to one ratio, they have this ratio, and so forth. Now I want to ask you the following question. How many rakahs do we pray in Three, Three rakahs, sah? Correct? Is that mentioned in the Quran? No. Who says yes? Hands up. No, no one. Maghrib, uh, Isha, sorry, four rakahs. Mentioned in the Quran? No. Yes? No? No. no. Okay. Hajj. Is it mentioned how many days Hajj is going to be? And, and what month of the year? Yes? No? Yes. Uh, Zakah. Nisab. For how much this is uh, Zakah's payable? Mentioned in the Quran? Yes? No. Okay. Mawari. Inheritance. Go to Surah An Nisa, the fourth chapter. Those verses. You will find the details of those are in those ayat delineating clearly how much the inheritors are meant to get. Ajeeb almost for us to imagine that the details of salah, which is Umud al Deen, the pillar of this faith, in spite of that, the details of it to that extent aren't mentioned. That is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet. And that doesn't detract from its importance at all. Yet in Mawari, in inheritance, it's explicitly mentioned. And to further drive home this point, it occurs in the hadith of Ahmed and Ibn Majah from the Prophet that famous hadith that you will be aware of, that a person can spend his whole life, 70 years of his life, and he can spend it upon ta'a, upon obedience, and yet, when he dies, he has his wealth distributed in a manner which is not in accordance with the Quran. And so, he ends up with a denizen of the fire. And another man, he spends his life, perhaps as we have spent our lives, in, a, in some type of sin, disobedience. And thereafter, he spends, he has his will made in a manner which is in accordance with the Quran. In a manner which is just. In a manner which will reflect the teachings of Allah Azza And thereby, he is admitted into the garden of Al Jannah. Reflect, my dear brothers and sisters, at the opportunity that is presented before each and every one of us through a just distribution. Okay, so now we're getting on to the meat of the topic. Okay? When a person passes away, for us as Muslims, before we talk about the, the UK's uh, uh, context, your will is not to anything to do with two-thirds of your estate. Estate is what you leave behind. Your will, essentially, is pertaining to the bequest, the wasiyah. A, a wasiyah is up to one-third of your estate. But before anything is touched, your, your wasiyah, your bequest, which we're going to explain what that is, and your will, something else has to be de uh, deducted, which is, Your expenses and your debt. And the very top it says, after expenses and debt, then the rest of your estate is to be distributed. Before that, if you have a debt, your debt cannot be, it has to be settled first and foremost. The Prophet said that even the Shaheed, the one who gave his whole life for the sake of Allah, he will not be admitted into Jannah until his debt is paid off. And so the Prophet sent them. And the Quranic, in fact, from the Quranic teaching is that the first thing is your debt will be paid off. Thereafter, your funeral expenses for your washing, your ghusl, for your shrouding and your burial. If your debt takes over all of your estate and consumes all of that, then 
your inheritors will not have to pay the remainder if there's, if, it's, if there's still more debt to be paid. But if they pay it off, it's very good for you and for us because it's such a serious matter. But thereafter, you have an optional share of one third which you can give in charity. The background behind this one third, Hans, does anyone know what the, what the background for this one third is? What is it? It occurs in the hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. The hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas of the Lord. That he came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have you know, several daughters and I'm older and I'm about to die and I want to give all my money away in charity. The Prophet said, Ya to Sa'ad, you could, no, not to do that. He said, then let me give a half. He said, no. He said, let me give two thirds. Or this, but it kept on going in different fractions. Two thirds and then a half. Then he said, eventually, a third. And then the Prophet said, okay, a third. But even a third is a lot. A thuruthu ya Sa'ad wa thuruthu kathir. So that's optional. But that can only be given a third of your estate to some type of charity. So for example, when you pass away, you know all of your deeds come to an end. إِذَا مَاتَ إِبْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ When the son of Adam, you, Ya Abdullah, and Muhammad, and Zayd, and Bakr, when you die, all of your deeds, they are seven and come to an end, except for three things. What are they? صَدَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ Second? وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُ A righteous child that will make supplication for you after you die. And thirdly, Beneficial knowledge. The, the, the one mentioned is Sadaqatun Jariyah that's relevant here. Once you die, if there's not some beneficial knowledge you left behind, if you don't have that righteous child and you have no guarantee your child might be righteous today, might be unrighteous tomorrow, the thing that you have a guarantee of is your Sadaqatun Jariyah, an ongoing charity to some orphanage, to a building of a well, to a masjid. To any good cause, you can donate it to any good charity, up to a third maximum. It could be an eighth, and that will benefit you after you're dead in your grave. That can also be given from that one third to some type of re some relatives who are not named recipients in the Quran. The Quran mentions, as in, once you die, you're in, you have certain relatives who are entitled to receive. Like your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your 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 children. Other than those, you can, they your third cousin twice removed, mother. He can receive from this one third. Likewise, we have a situation where relatives. Maybe I should stand up for a second. What? Where? where likewise, non-Muslims, a revert. When a revert becomes Muslim, his Relatives cannot receive inheritance from him. The Prophet said, لا يرث الكافر والمسلم A non-Muslim cannot receive inheritance from a Muslim. And likewise, vice versa. So, when, if I become Muslim, if I was a non-Muslim and I become Muslim, and now I'm, I have no relatives that are Muslim, who should I give all my inheritance to? I am allowed to give up to one third from my estate to my non-Muslim relatives not as inheritance, but as a bequest. The remaining two-thirds, there are certain rules. And that's not for me to decide. Allah Azza wa Jal has automatically transferred ownership soon as I die to these relatives. So, you have, there's a poster there which unfortunately might prevent you from seeing one of the figure fractions. We can, yes, maybe if you just move it slightly. Anyway. Okay, so you have one eighth for the wife. I hope no one minds. That's fine. So the wife of the husband, she's to receive one eighth of. So your wives, when you pass away, brothers, they will receive. One eighth of your of your estate, if you have children. 
But if you don't have children, then you will receive, then your wives will receive a quarter. Allah says, إِنْ كَانَ لَهُ وَلَدْ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلَدْ فَلَهُنَّ الثُّمُنُ فَلَهُنَّ الرُّضُعُ مِمَّا تَرَى Then they'll have a quarter of what the husband needs behind. Likewise, a husband, he will receive from his wife's estate a half if she has no children. And if she has children, he'll receive a quarter. Now, this is from the justice of Allah and from his hikmah, his wisdom. However, we should understand and appreciate that it is upon us as men to be the maintainers of the women folk in our families. So the husband receives this because he's going to have to look after all of the other women folk who are in his family. His sisters, potentially, his wife, his mother, his daughters. That's his duty, your duty. But the wife, it's not her duty to be spending on any husband she marries afterwards. It's not her duty to be spending upon, her, uh, upon uh, say, her parents if they are, have full means and so forth. In principle, that's her money. Likewise, the mother and the father, they receive a sixth of the, inherit of the estate if the deceased, their, their child, has children. If, if they don't have children, they will receive, the mother will receive a third. So what does the son and daughter get? It's on the board. They receive a two to one ratio. Okay? And so let's bring this to life now. With a practical example. And I need you to pay attention. I'm going to test. Uh, did I tell you earlier? I'm going to test you as well. I didn't tell you. Did I tell you? No. Malish. No. Never mind. So, and people in front of me will get tested first. It's just one of the qadda and qadr that that's what happens. So go. So Imran married Rehana. Ya salam, mashallah. And okay, Imran passed away. He leaves behind his father <laughs> and his wife and son. Now, what? Wait, this piece inside. What will the father get? One six. One twelfth. One fourth. One six. One six. We have all the fractions here. So, one. So say one six. Why one six? Yes. Okay. So the wife will get one. Okay. And the son will get how much? Son. The son The The wife will get how much? One eight. One eight. One eight. Very impressive, mashallah. Let's see. Okay, Allah Azza just says, the translation would be, if his pa for his parents, each one, uh, each one's share is a sixth in Canada wallet if he has a child. Okay, the wife and son, and Allah has a sense regarding the wife, as you can see, she gets an eighth. The son, okay. So now let's see how it looks in a diagram. So, here, the husband dies, okay? The mother will get a sixth, as the brother said. The wife will get an eighth. And then the residue, whatever's left, will go to the son. Wow. Say much. <laughs> okay. But he then has to look after his wife. Look after who? His mother. Who's the wife of the seed? And maybe even his grandmother. Yeah? Another example. Jamila is married to Jamila. No, to Maryam. And then Maryam passes away, leaving behind a husband. So, okay. So, what's the husband going to get? A quarter? A quarter. The son gets how much and the daughter gets how much? And the son gets the t twice as the daughter. Twice as much as the daughter. Okay. Let's see. This is the verse for the, of the fourth quarter for the husband. Good, mashallah. The son and daughter, as we said before, two to one ratio. Now, 
So what's going to happen? Let's see. How will it look? The husband, he will get the quarter, as you saw. The daughter will get, and the son will get two quarters, and the son, daughter will get one quarter, a two to one ratio. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. Any questions? Heavy stuff, huh? No, hunger is simple. Okay, so now, UK inheritance law. This is very, very important. Because this now, building in the context for our application of Sharia in our, our lives. How many times do we spend, or do we hear about the importance of Sharia and this and that, the other, and we get upset when, you know, people um, deride the Sharia as this and that, the other. However, when it comes to our own opportunities to apply the Sharia in our lives by having a will and understanding the UK inheritance laws and making sure we can avail ourselves of the opportunities to make it compliant with the Quran, we're not doing it. So we need to now focus on this. When you die without a will, you're known as to have died in the state of intestacy. You are intestate. That means you died without a will. Now this is going to have ramifications and repercussions on how your estate is going to be divided and distributed after you die. So when you die, and you, we all have to die, then the first 250,000 plus what they call chattels, which is items such as your furniture, your car, and so on, will go to your wife. But before that, all your jointly owned assets have, are going to be passed also to your wife. So what are your jointly owned assets? So for example, it's very common for people in the UK and in the West generally, that your assets, such as your house, will be jointly owned. Your wife will own half and you will own half. If that's, ha if that's the arrangement you have right now, then when you die automatically, your half will pass into your wife's name. That's for jointly owned assets. And that also can be your car. If you, it's jointly owned, automatically it will pass to your wife's name. Is there a problem with that? For us as Muslims. Some questions. Not from the Sharia. Uh, <coughs> that should not conform with, uh, not conform with the previous example, whereby the wife gets an eight. Fantastic. That's the point I wanted to hear. Because the point is, that's not a Quranic distribution. But that's what will happen automatically to your estate, potentially, if you don't have a will. And any one of your inheritors says they want the, the English law, which is the law of intestacy, if you don't have a will. Join your own assets <coughs> directly will go to the wife. And no one can do anything about it, because that's what the law says, if you don't have a will. So join your own assets will go to the wife, to, or to the surviving partner, rather. The first 250,000 will pass on to the wife, along with chattels. Then the remaining parts of the remaining estate is put into two separate estates, two separate trusts. And the first trust will be put into, it's basically, a trust is basically a legal document which locks up that money. And only it will earn riba, interest. And the riba of it, the riba of it will actually be what pays off, will pay in monthly installments or in periodic installments to your wife. So your wife will have to live off the riba. And that will be her sustenance. Because you don't have a wife. Then the second half will be put into another trust, locked up. And that's locked up for whom? Your children. So they can't benefit from it at all until they are 18 years old. And when they're 18, then each of your children, boys and girls, will have to get an equal share. Thereafter, they're allowed to redistribute it, but if they choose not to, no one can say anything. Because you didn't make the world to say it has to be distributed from the Quran. Okay? <coughs> now, there are some UK tax inheritance laws you need to be aware of. When you die, you actually have to pay. People think RIP means rest in peace, correct? There's in fact a true hidden meaning to it. And that's you get ripped off. Because you will have to pay 40% tax of your, on your estate for dying. 
You have to, it's called a death tax. You pay the tax when to die. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Literally, you have to pay 40% if you die. And th this 40% is levied, that means it's charged on your estate if you're above a threshold. The threshold is called the NRB or the nil rate ban. And this will keep increasing over years, but currently it's 325,000 if you're a single person. If you're a married couple, we're going to talk about how you can join that. But 3 to 5k is the threshold. Anyone who owns more than that, they'll be charged 40%. <coughs> and I want you to see, and this case study is going to illustrate for you in a vivid fashion how much that means. So, you have a brother here. What's your name, brother? No, you. No, no you. you. <laughs> Mustafa. MashaAllah. You know, it's one of the amazing things. Whenever I ask a brother in a talk, what's his name? And he's in front of me always, he'll be Mustafa, inshallah. And you know what? Maybe there's some sir. Sir means secret to that. Mustafa means the chosen one. And you're the chosen one for the question. <laughs> mashallah. So, yeah, Mustafa. Mustafa, mashallah, he starts up a new business. Yeah? And he suddenly becomes almost a millionaire overnight. Okay? 800,000. You wish, no? Or maybe you are. Yeah? So, 800,000. Then, he becomes shaykh. Yeah? Okay? Inshallah. Say inshallah. Inshallah. All of us, inshallah. So, 800,000 is his, is his estate. According to the shari, shari uh, distributions in the Quran, your wife will get 100,000, mashallah. Yeah? Your, that's just one wife you have, yes? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> So, uh, 1,000. If you have four, then the khalas, you have to, they have to share. That's perhaps why they want only one. Yeah? So, 100,000. Your father will get 133,000. Mother will get 133. And daughter, as you can see, and, and son getting those portions. But what about, before that, you have to have your body washed, agreed, your debts paid, and your shrouding and burial. But before any of your burial and your shrouding and everything else, there's something else. Inheritance tax. You forgot your first inheritor is George Osborne and the Queen. <laughs> They're the first inheritors that you, from your estate. How much will they get? So you have 325 is the mill rate ban. That's what you're not going to be taxed on. Above that, you're going to be taxed. So your net estate, therefore, is 475. Your tax liability, therefore, Who's good at the maths? Is 190,000 pounds going to her royal highness the queen and George Osborne. Yes? So that's how it happens. So, subhanAllah, if you just made the extra effort to ensure you protected your assets more, in a more robust fashion, if you're above the narrow band, we would suggest you don't use this world. Would you actually get a special professional uh, uh, advice, take cons uh, consultancy, and you actually get a specially designed world to save your sufferings, and it's possible. But this just shows you the importance, brothers, of two things. One, how your offspring and your inheritors can benefit so much by you taking, making a bit of effort in this regard. And but secondly, and more importantly perhaps, how, if you don't take due care right now, and your, a situation arises whereby your inheritors contest, you know, how the, the estate should be distributed, how that will lead to your estate not being distributed according to the Quran. So, so, so now some key rules. So, the question? Turn back to the motion, please. On the previous. There is a mistake there. No, 40% of 475,000. Yes. But I like it because you're good at maths, Marshall. Yeah. <laughs> so that means you got you, you did the calculation that 40% of 800,000. I usually ask people who's good at maths and then they didn't do the calculation for us. But today we thought we'd give an easy chance to you all and we did the calculation for you. Now, brothers uh, and sisters. One of the points that married couples have a double 
NLP, a double, double neural expand. So when, for example, I die, yes, then if I, I'm single, right? If I'm single, then I will have a neural band of three to five. Okay. If I'm married, then my wife, Mathurin, can join her NLV and my NLV neural band, and three to five plus three to five equals six fifty. So if, if, um, for example, Brother Mustafa had gifted me part of his uh, eight hundred thousand, and I have. Uh, 600,000 he's given me, mashallah, because you know, he's very generous. Then, then, I'm 600,000 is less than 650. So, correct? So, I won't have any tax on me. Because my wife was very clever, mashallah, she enjoyed the, the narrow band together. And that's what you need to remember. Now, there's another point, which is that we mentioned any asset which is jointly owned, yes, will pass directly in my wife's name at the point of death. Now, if I were to have a more Islamically correct option, there's another format of ownership, and that's called joint tenants in common. Okay? Joint tenants and <coughs> tenants in common. These are two separate things. Joint tenants and tenants in common. Joint tenants, anything you I own, when I die, will go straight to my wife. If she dies first, anything she owns in joint tenancy will go straight to me. And that's not the Quranic distribution. Agreed. Tenants in common is different. I own the house half half. Yeah? So, for example, anything my wife, not my wife, anything my my my, my wife owns will be distributed when she passes away, will be distributed according to her will. Yeah? And I will retain my half. And anything when I die will be distributed also according to my will and not pass straight to her. So when I die in the tenants in common, it doesn't transfer straight to her. It gets distributed according to my will. So if you want to have that arrangement, you need to go to a solicitor or whatever and change the arrangement of your ownership. The only exception to keeping tenants, uh, joint tenants is if you are certain your wife and your children will be amicably, am amicably able to resolve, redistribute the estate having made it uh, tax uh, efficient and they redistributed it according to the Quran. Can someone, can you put your hands up if you understood this? Would you want me to re-explain? Re-explain? Yeah. Okay. You have two forms of ownership. Okay? Tenants in common and joint tenancy. Most people currently, they will own their property in Joint tenancy. With joint tenancy, if I die, everything will pass to my wife. This is not, yeah? To my wife, yeah? If she dies first, anything that she owns will pass to me. Straight. That's called what? Joint tenancy. That, if, it, now if that happens and she doesn't redistribute it to my children, is that Islamic? It's, it's opposite to the Quran. So, if I think there's a chance that they won't do that, that I, they won't redistribute according to the Quran, I have another option. I can do tenants in common. With tenants in common, when I die, my, her portion will stay hers. And my portion will get distributed according to my will. And when she dies, my portion stays mine. And her portion will get distributed according to her will. So that is a much easier option from an Islamic perspective, although there will be more tax implications there. So you need to weigh up those options. Tax implications versus will it be done according to uh, Quran. Okay. That is uh, in tenants in common. Yes. You and your wife, you have had to sit down Mm -hmm. And what things that okay, this is your share, this is my share. Uh, for, for for house ownership or for anything. Your your anything you own together jointly, legally, yes. should have some type of document establishing who owns how much. What? So there will for example in my for my house, yes. my wife or, or for example anybody or Sadr Umar over here, 
what, if he has you know one of his houses and he shares this with his um, second wife, mashallah, yeah, or was it third wife? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so with his third wife, he's shared, he decided he shared it with her, but obviously he's had to share give one house to share it with his first and second because you have to be equal, yeah. But with his house, this is the main point here. The document has to say this house, mansion, mashallah, is owned in 50% to Umar Malik and 50% to uh, Mrs. Malik. Yeah? Mashallah. Yeah? He's not married, by the way. Mashallah. Yeah? So, but if he's owned in different shares, that should also be written there. Okay? So, when you're, this is what, what you're going to say. When you're writing your will, you need to put in it in your will a clear list of what you own, your assets. And also you have to clearly establish who owns what. Who owns what. You won't believe it, brothers and sisters. How many disputes come between brothers? Mathana, you have two brothers. Yeah? Abdullah and Zayd. And they both have been working in, uh, to make a shop business uh, su successful. Abdullah passes away. The kids of Abdullah come and try and claim their estate. Zaid will say, "What? Your 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 father didn't uh, work in the shop. He just bought a small portion of it. I've been slogging in it. I've been working, so I should get a bigger share. And your your father doesn't ha didn't have much of a share. You need to make sure everything is documented with clear guidance. There's an expression in English which is very true: live like brothers." Deal like strangers. Live like brothers, deal like strangers. So you live with that compassion, but when it comes to dealings, you should be very clear. And that's a Quranic teaching. Yeah? Have it written down. Okay. So, the other point to bear in mind here is. Oh, if you just. Uh, yeah. Is that. Anything you transfer in your lifetime to your spouse, yes? This is the next point, brothers, on the slide. Anything you transfer in your life to your spouse as a gift, Islamically, that's allowed, yeah? And likewise, from a tax perspective, there's no tax consequence of that. Third point is that when you die, if you've gifted something, Mustafa gifted me a hundred thousand pounds, mashallah, yeah? Because he's generous, as we said. Then, if he dies that year, then I will. Then there'll still be a tax levied upon that hundred thousand pounds because he died. He had to pay to die, and he has to pay from that money he gave me. If he dies two years after he gifted me that thing, you knock off two sevenths of that tax, and five sevenths of the tax will still be payable by me. If seven years go, then khalas, that, that that tax is removed altogether. You can also use ta uh, trust to, to actually safeguard your wealth as well. Now brothers, I want you, I'm going to now show you how to fill out this world. Well now you convert the in time, there's a, a, a spare pen here for whoever wants to fill it up here. Who's going to fill it up right now? Okay, I'm going to actually show you anyway how to do it. So if you turn to page 10, this, once you fill out this will in the form that we're saying, you need to make very clear, list your main assets, your debts, your bank account numbers, and your land registry records. These four things, what are they? Your main assets, your debts, your bank account details, and your land registry. This should all be documented here. You should keep your will in a safe place so your family know where it is. Okay? Because otherwise, khalas, you've written your will and you've kept it in a safe which no one knows the, the, the code to. No one knows about the will. Yes? You're in trouble. The good is not existing. Also, if you've got young children, you will need to state who your guardians of your children will be. Okay? But for your guardians and the executors, yeah? Uh, of this will, who will be executing this will, you need their consent beforehand. You need their permission. Don't let it be a shock to them. 
also brothers and sisters, when you write a will right now, make sure that you, your spouse, your wife, or your husband also has a will. You need an independent will. Because if I die first, then my wife should have If she dies first, she could die first. There's also a possibility we could die at the same time. So having a, both independent wills is very, very important. You need to have a... Also, brothers, you have a question? To have a valid will in the UK, you need to fulfill certain criteria. What are they? Question? I was going to say, uh, so you need this has been established. Has the system got his will? Someone can do that. Shall we? Is, is this will yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 valid? Sorry? Is, yes, any, any will. You don't even need that, brother. If it's on a, a normal piece of paper, it's fine. The advantage of this is that it's been checked by Al Qalam Sharia Al Hamd. So it's actually this this one here. So it's the wording of it's kind of covering many things. You know, all the Islamic things in terms of I, I want to be washed, I want to be buried, I want to be shrouded. Because according to UK law, you can be buried without being washed. And they'll bury you in your clothing right now. Yeah? And even your 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 jewel for the women, the jewelry and makeup can go with them. This is how the law is, yeah. So if you want to be washed and shrouded and so on, this is all written here. So I'm now going to demonstrate for you very clearly here. You can put the camera here if you want. I'm going to make my work here. Can I have a, another one? Bismillah ar rahim Okay, so my, will, my name is Muhammad Abid Khan. What's today's date?